Well, good evening. Good evening and welcome to our Ignite service for March 12th. And Lent is going by quick. Look how light it is outside. Isn't that great? <laughs> you might not have liked the dark this morning, but it's nice having the light at night. So what a glorious day. So let's start off the right way. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you. And thank you for coming. For those of you that are here, thank you so much. Those of you that are watching online, thank you. It's a blessing to have you join us. And for those that are watching later on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook channels and so on, thank you so much for being there and watching. Again, so glad you're here. On the tables there are, and I want to thank Reverend Cindy and Lisa as they updated the attendance pads. So there, the attendance pads are there. There are prayer request cards there. There are offering envelopes on the table. So go ahead and take care of those. You can give the prayer request cards to Reverend Cindy and obviously the offering envelopes in the back. But let's get started the right way with the Ignite Music Team.
see it. We'll start with some quick announcements. Yeah. And first of all, as a reminder, we have script. So if you want to get that right afterward, you can do that here. Of course, you can do it at church. You can do it either place. So you can get those to always keep track of your circuit rider. And as always, keep track of all the things and new things are running back. Quick announcement for this coming Wednesday. There is no youth or youth group or after school daycare or community meal. However, from 630 to 15, there is youth movie night. I know Sarah wouldn't mind if some adults popped in. She's got some good movies picked out. So, again, take care of those. If you are keeping track of your miles, get hold of Lisa for the walk to Jerusalem because we are adding those up, and they're adding up fast. Right? They, are. they are adding up fast. And as always, we do encourage you to keep track and participate in the Life 316 because that indeed is what it's all about. But a much more important announcement. Yes. We have an all-church dance on um Friday night from 7 to 9, and so uh, wear some green for St. Patrick's Day, but come and enjoy a dance. Uh, Fred Ritter of Voice House is going to DJ, and we know Fred is awesome, and so uh, please come and have some fun. We're going to have punch and refreshments, but come and enjoy some fun on Friday night. So ironically this week, um, when I opened up my folder, some of you have heard this story, when I opened up my folder, uh, for preaching on Woman at the Well, I noticed that there was a letter sandwiched in there, and it was nine years ago at Trinity in Westridge that a letter was read, and I had served there four years, and I was being appointed to Columbus. And so um, God has an interesting sense of humor um, that uh, I have the opportunity to share another letter. Uh, nine years ago, I was appointed to serve as senior pastor of Columbus First United Methodist Church, and my family embraced the changes and opportunities before us. And since that time, we welcomed associate pastors and staff members and said goodbyes to some of them. Um, you purchased a facility that would become this building, our outreach center, and in doing so, established this church with many community, community partnerships in mission and ministry. You had the stained glass windows of the church completely redone. You addressed safety, security, and accessibility at both of our facilities. Each of these things has been thoughtfully and prayerfully approached, and your faith, hope, and love has been evident every step of the way, and it has been a privilege to serve as your senior pastor. In consultation with the cabinet and Bishop David Wilson, I have been appointed to serve as lead pastor of Faith Westwood United Methodist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, effective on July 1st, 2023. And Clint and I accepted this appointment and covenant to serve as um, a part of the Great Plains United Methodist Annual Conference to trust in the process and to allow the Spirit to lead. Of course, as you know, um, Clint and I had to do this, or this discernment with him being in Florida all week. <laughs> and so um, it's it's good for us to be together now so that we can continue to process together. Um, I've shared that I shared this morning that for those who are newer to our congregation, especially those who might be tuning in online with us, our connectional denomination means that the very best pastor will be appointed to this congregation to engage in the important mission and ministry in this place. And so please pray for the cabinet and bishop's discernment for this pastor. And um, like I shared this morning, that remember that we have three months of important ministry to do. And so um, this isn't tomorrow morning, all of a sudden I wake up and I'm a lame duck for three months. Um, I want to continue uh, to be a part of the mission and ministry until my very last Sunday. Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of questions. There's more questions than answers right now, and the cabinet has not yet discerned who that pastor is going, the senior pastor will be to follow me. Um, and no, Clint and I have not figured out all of the details with Farm and his appointments and how all of this is going to look. And no, Miss Emma, if she's tuning in, she has not decided where she's going to live this summer. She just may be looking to live with someone in, in Columbus, so just a heads up. Um, but we have deeply appreciated this congregation. We have so many treasured memories. And one of the things that I hold near and dear to my heart is that uh, this congregation really helped to raise our daughters and to remind them to love God and to love neighbor. And uh, for that, um, I believe I can speak for both of us. We are eternally grateful. 
And so, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Cindy. If you've ever seen the cartoon where the Wiley Coyote's jaw drops to the floor and his eyes get about this big, that was me this morning at about 9 o'clock <laughs> when Reverend Cindy shared that. So, again, Reverend Cindy, thank you. And uh, granted, we have uh, three months yet until we get to work together, but thank you for all that you've done. So let's begin with our joys and our concerns at this point. Obviously, we just shared a large joy and for concerns. stewards and concerns. Uh, so we want to keep them and all of us in, uh, in our prayers in both, both directions. Are there other joys? Look around, I'm always missing folks. Yes? Keaton literally just got home an hour ago. Keaton got home an hour ago. His place was very well. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. And just think how much better you're going to be in the next year as you continue to lead that group, right? Well, congratulations and welcome back. Okay. And, of course, we have another visitor. We've, we've also got Kyson back on spring break. He's in town for spring break this week. And Javen had spring break last week and was not able to come. So you guys missed him. Sorry. So. <laughs> He was here Wednesday night, so you got to go 100% with Javen last week and 100% with, okay, Tyson this week, so great. Well, very good. Well, welcome, and again, glad to have you back. Other joys? Those are fun. Yes, please. My niece, Sydney, and the Midland Dance Warriors took second place in the national championship they attended this past weekend. And for those of you who remember Monica Weber, who used to sing with us occasionally, she is in Dream Girls at the Omaha Community Playhouse right now. And to borrow a phraseology from the younger generation, she slays. She is so, so, so very good. Catch the show if you possibly can. It's a fun show anyway. That's Dream Girls in Omaha. Dream right? Girls in Omaha. Community Playhouse. Community Playhouse. Okay, very good. And as they say, break away from money. Yes. Obviously, not literally. But other joys and concerns. Joys will go on with those or concerns that need to be brought forward. I'm going to share one more joy. My daughter-in-law had a birthday last Friday, so we celebrated a little bit with her. Uh, we'll do more of that later. The joys, birthdays, anniversaries. My dad's first heavenly birthday was Saturday, and he would have turned 80 this year. So. Your dad, that's right. His birthday was Saturday, would have turned 80 this year. So happy, happy heavenly birthday. All right. Other joys, concerns. I think we can continue to lift up prayers for all those that are suffering under any type of violence. There seems to be more and more violent acts on TV. And those that are suffering as you watch the weather channels in California with the flooding and the storms and the Gulf Coast. And so there is so much going on for so many folks. So all of those that are struggling now with those sort of disasters in their lives, we certainly want to keep them all in our prayers. And those families that have lost someone recently, obviously want to keep them in our prayers. Those who are in the hospital, those in hospice, those receiving treatments of any kind, those that have received any hard diagnoses, keep those in, those folks in our prayers. Our uh, prayers for Stephanie Borakoit, who is having more medical tests tomorrow and then planning to have gallbladder surgery on Wednesday. For Stephanie Borakoit, who is having testing tomorrow and then surgery, gallbladder surgery on Wednesday. Okay, so definitely prayers for Stephanie. Things go smoothly and well, and everything turns out the way that it sh we hope and pray for. Other concerns? Okay, let's take these to God. Dear God, we come to you with praise and thanks for all the many wonders that you give us each and every day. But Lord God, we also come to you humbly, knowing that in our own we're not worthy. That because of you and because of your gift, your gift of living water and holy water, we can indeed be saved and washed clean.
clean. Lord God, we lift joys of family being back and birthdays, celebrating activities. And Lord God, our hearts are heavy for those that are suffering, suffering under violent acts or natural disasters. And Lord God, as we celebrate this time with Reverend Cindy and Clint and their family, as we celebrate their joy and as we celebrate our sorrow for them going to leave, that we ask that you continue to give us the discernment and give us the power and give us the understanding. And let us know that, God, in all things, you are indeed in control. If we can turn our hearts and our eyes and our faith and our trust in you, Lord God, we do know that all things will indeed work out. And Lord God, there are those things that are on our minds and on our hearts that were not spoken earlier. Lord God, hear those prayers now. Lord God, again, we thank you, knowing that you are there, that you are indeed in control, and we come to you in the name of your Son, who taught us all how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's rise and sing. Come alive.
God, it's a little cold to go outside and to be immersed by waters. But it's not precipitating. But help us to claim the waters, the holy waters tonight. Hear our words and bless them and the meditations of our heart, God, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. There was something about my trip to Israel that was filled with blessing, and honestly, I was drawn to the water. Whether it was on the River Jordan when the water was about 40 degrees, or the Sea of Galilee, and we were on a boat, or whether it was in the Dead Sea and several people were floating in it. <laughs> Each of those moments on water in the Holy Land felt holy and set apart and special. Of course, everything in the Holy Land was filled with this kind of holiness. Now, I'll be honest, the preaching team wrestled with the scripture and topic a bit. And we landed on holy water as the theme and the river as our song. We wanted to embrace the idea of that living water that Jesus uh, talked about with the woman at the well, which was discussed this morning, and to talk about how that living water continued to change lives in the early church. And this is quite evident in our focus passage. But first, just a little background. After the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, things were really moving in that early church. The word was spreading, and things were moving and shaking, sometimes literally. And the church then also found out that there were some problems. Some of the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the apostles chose seven men to help in the process. And Philip, who we are talking about today, was one of the seven chosen in chapter 6, along with another familiar name, Stephen, who became the first martyr with Saul's approval. Now, I want you to stay with me for a moment as we think about this early church, because that helps to set up our scene today. When the church was being persecuted in Jerusalem, many Christians began to scatter, and they scattered to places like Judea and Samaria to avoid being dragged off and put into prison by Saul. Philip then found himself in Samaria. His ministry was powerful there. He began to speak about the gospel message, the good news, and then he began to perform many signs and wonders. He became known for his healing miracles and for those times when spirits, evil spirits, would come out of people, and he would also heal the paralyzed and make them walk again. Acts 8.8 8 says, So there was great joy in the city, and that's as a result of Philip's ministry. Now we know that the apostles began to expect the unexpected when it came to their mission. They went where they were led by the power of the Holy Spirit. So an angel tells Philip to go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And when he did what the angel instructed, he encountered that Ethiopian eunuch. Now a basic understanding of the eunuch is that he was an official who was in service to a ruler. This particular eunuch was an important official who was in charge of the treasury of the Queen of Ethiopia. Important, right? He had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and now he was reading the book of Isaiah. Philip realized that the Spirit had led him to this chariot and to this eunuch. This eunuch was eager to know about what he was reading. Was it about the prophet Isaiah himself, or was it someone else? This was the opening that Philip needed to proclaim the truth and the good news about Jesus. And then they came to some water. This is where we pick up. And it wasn't Philip who saw the opportunity to use that water for baptism. It was the eunuch. It was the eunuch that seized that moment to be baptized by what he claimed as holy water. This passage has a very interesting characteristic that you, may, you, you wouldn't have seen it on the screen. But there is a verse that is missing. Verse 37 just kind of has a, has a little footnote around it. It's actually left empty, but the footnote says this. Some manuscripts include here. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. You may be baptized. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Now, I'm not exactly sure why this was included. I didn't go back through all my history books to find out exactly why this wasn't included. But the footnote indicates that this eunuch believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He understood the role of baptism in this belief. Now, this reminds me of my first appointment in Stanton Pilger United Methodist Churches. There was a gentleman in one of the towns, his name was Gerald, and he was homebound. He was in his late 80s, and he had never been baptized. This family was unchurched in every sense of the word, and one of the family members had opened a door to the conversation of baptism with him, and she asked if it was okay if I would visit him, and she asked me if I would go and visit him. We became acquainted, and over several visits, I asked if he had any questions, and if he wanted to learn more about Jesus, and then he brought up baptism. He said, I want to be baptized, but I've been too embarrassed to bring it up. He told me that growing up, every one that he knew was baptized. And yet not one member of his family had been. He said as he got older, he said he never thought that the opportunity to be baptized would ever come up. So I must have been listening to the Spirit that day. I had a little mini bowl and pitcher that could be used for baptisms with me in my car. And I told him I wanted to read some scripture to him, and I read this scripture to him. And as I read this scripture, I saw his eyes light up, and I told him that I had vessels and I had water to be used for baptism. And if he believed and he was willing, we could do it that day. I watched Gerald's entire face light up. And he loudly said, I believe. I was so teary, and I was shaking when I went out to my car. And when I came back, we blessed the water, and I had the privilege of baptizing Gerald in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I asked for the Holy Spirit to work within, within him, that being born of water and the Spirit, he could live out his days as a faithful disciple of Jesus. So because we believe in community baptism, and we believe that baptism is a community event, I had actually already gotten permission to baptize him because he was homebound. He also could not enter into the church because of all the steps that were there. But he consented to allowing me to take his picture holding the water bowl as a way to celebrate with the church family who couldn't be there. And so on the next Sunday, we put his picture up on the screen, and we all uh, prayed over that, and we, we praised God, and I even put his address in the bulletin so that church members could welcome him as a family and new brother of Christ. I don't know the rest of the story. I, um, I don't remember when he passed away, I was already, I had already gone to the next appointment when that happened, but I do believe that, that that baptism for him was something that had been missing in his life, that it was something that filled him, and it allowed him to feel the Spirit in a way maybe that he never had. And I know that the Spirit allowed that holy water to do its work with someone who needed it most. Now, going back to our scripture passage, when Philip then baptized the eunuch, and when they came out of the water, we're told something that sounds a little incredulous, doesn't it? That Philip was taken away by the Holy Spirit to his hostess, and he was continuing to preach the gospel there. It sounds a bit dramatic, doesn't it? <laughs> to me, it sounded a little bit like Star Trek. But again, we're talking about this Spirit of God that was moving so powerfully in the early church. So if the Spirit needed Philip to be in one place in one moment and in another place to stay on task and to move in a miraculous way, we know that it was absolutely positively pos possible. Now, I read this past week, the flow of water teaches us to let go and move forward and embrace the flow of life. You know, um, the Spirit moves in mysterious ways, and I have to say that that's probably, that quote was probably for me and my family more than anything. But I also thought that it was powerful for this passage. The flow of water teaches us to let go and move forward, embrace the flow of life. Isn't that what Philip did? 
Philip allowed the holy waters of his own baptism to teach him to let go and to allow the Spirit to move him forward and to move the church forward. From the time he was selected as one of the seven to care for the widows and their food to eventually baptizing strangers along the way, Philip demonstrates the power of listening to the Spirit's call. And because he did, people's lives were changed inside the existing church and in the development of new ones. And now the proverbial rest of the story is that eunuch went back to Ethiopia and those holy waters that transformed his life led to the future Ethiopian church. When I was in, in Israel, we actually had an opportunity to visit an Ethiopian church located in Jerusalem. And now I know who to thank for that. You know, Acts reveals these powerful stories and reminds us of the holy water that transforms and blesses. Do you remember when those holy waters first blessed you? Some of you were babies, and so you only saw pictures of it, right? Some of you were children, and some of you were adults. But no matter how old, no matter where, that holy water marked you as a believer and follower in Christ. Tonight, I want to offer a reaffirmation of your baptism covenant. This is not a rebaptism. This is just a blessing as a reminder of the holy water that still transforms you each day. Let's go down to that proverbial river to pray, to be washed, and to, be, to rise up in amazing grace. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of holy water that reminds us of the Spirit's presence in our life. Bless this water on all who receive it to fill them with your Spirit. And when we touch the water tonight, renew our covenant with you to believe and to trust in your eternal promises. Amen. So as the Spirit leads, come, touch the water. You can make the sign of the cross on your hand or on your forehead to remember this holy water. Come.
Receive our benediction. May the gift of holy water keep blessing you, keeping you, inspiring you, and transforming you. Go in peace. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And let's sing of this holy water.